And now, ladies and gentlemen, Ralph Emery. Well, hi, everybody. Here we go again. This time out, our guest is a country music legend with 39 top 10 hits. 17 of those were number one. In his career, he's been named Entertainer of the Year, Male Vocalist of the Year. He's also been awarded the Song of the Year title, Single and Album of the Year honors. I've spent time with him on the road, on radio, on television. So this is a reunion for me tonight. I want to welcome my old friend, Mickey Gilly. Why, we even dressed alike tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Ralph, it is a pleasure to be on your show. We've been trying to find a, a place for me to come in and talk to you, and uh, I'm just glad to be here. Thank you for having me on. Well, you have a remarkable story, and it's a very recent story. I want to go to a headline that uh, I found, and uh, this is a headline that says, Gilly undergoes brain surgery. This was in the uh, Branson Daily Independent newspaper on August 3rd, 2008. And I want you to tell me what happened. July the 8th, I went into uh, uh, Cox South Hospital, and a Dr. Mace was a surgeon. And he installed... Was this in Springfield? Springfield, Missouri. I should have said that, I guess. <laughs> and he installed what they call a shunt. And that's where they put a hole in your skull, and they put it in, and they drag it down through your, under your skin and down to your stomach. They call it a perineum. I call it a stomach. But anyway, <clears throat> uh, the, one, of the, 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 one of the neurologists, uh, uh, Dr. Diane Carnelison, told me when she looked at my MRI and my uh, CAT scan, she said, my God, Gilly, you look like you got a swimming pool up there. The ventricles in my brain were swollen up with fluid. And it was causing me off balance. It was causing me to stumble. And a lot of people in Branson, when I was trying to do my performance, I walked real slow because I couldn't move hardly. I couldn't even hardly get out of bed, lost my strength. And they thought I was drinking on stage, which was I wasn't drinking at all, you know. But they put that uh, Dr. Mace in uh, Springfield, put this shunt in for me. And when I came out of the surgery, I was only overnight thing. And the reason why I mention this is because there's a lot of people probably had the same problem I've had and they could get help for it. It's, it's just incredible what it did for me. My strength came back, my balance came back, and when I came out of this surgery, I went to the, uh, uh, through the corridors of the hospital hollering, where's my Superman cape? I'm ready to fly. <laughs> did you say that the doctors down in Houston had uh, turned you away? Well, they wanted to, they told me they could retrain my brain because it was a very invasive surgery, and I was getting sicker and sicker. And uh, I finally went to uh, a doctor, uh, um, that that my um, one of my girl singers, uh, Dr. Michael Bays, is a is a eyes ears throat doctor. Uh, I think this I might have got that all wrong, but anyway, she is the the wife of this particular doctor, and he and he invited me to go over and see this Dr. Diane Cornelius. Needless, and I'm not probably not pronounced her name correct because I have a hard time. I call her Dr. Diane. Okay. But anyway, she looked at the MRIs and the uh, everything else. She said, I'm gonna. I'm going to introduce you to a surgeon that can take care of that. And she introduced me to uh, a Dr. Mace. And uh, uh, the surgery was overnight. It was very quick. It was kind of scary because when you think about him putting a hole in your skull and putting a thing into your brain, but he had to drain the fluid out of my ventricles of my brain so that my, everything would come back to me. And it was almost immediate relief. I couldn't believe what happened to me. So your head was full of water? Well, well fluid. Yeah. Uh, I guess you'd call it water. I didn't drink that much water because I always said water rushed your pipes. Uh, <laughs> what, do you, what do you call this? It's called hydrocephalus. Yeah. I finally had to learn how to say it after I had it so long. Has this <laughs> changed your lifestyle? Absolutely. I mean, I, I'm, I'm back to, uh, I, I feel like I'm 50 again. Now, you know how old I am because your birthday is one day later than mine. That's right. You're March 9th. I'm March 10th. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> Uh, when, did you, when did you realize you had a problem? Well, I started stumbling, and I fell a couple of times and busted my uh, eye. And uh, I went to the doctor, and they did an MRI on my head. And the first thing they came up with, they said, you got fluid, but we can do this with water pills. Well, it didn't work. And I was getting sicker and sicker. Were you get, could you remember the words to songs, or did you forget? I had a short-term memory loss. And uh, every now and then I'd start dropping lines, and I couldn't talk to the people like I'm used to talking because I've got a big mouth, you know, and I go all the time. <laughs> you know how I talk. But I was getting slower and slower, and uh, 
I, I would stumble on some of my words and I'd um, walk real slow. I couldn't hardly get around. I lost my strength. I had a hard time. Uh, if I got into a tub of water, I couldn't get out of it. Sometimes uh, I had a problem getting up. Do you think you were dying? Uh, eventually, she told me that if it wasn't corrected, that I would, uh, it would turn into dementia. Then uh, the big A, the all-timers, I think old-timers. Yeah. I call it the old-timers. Right. <laughs> and then uh, I'd be in a nursing home, and the first thing I'd be is in a you know, wheelchair, and, a, and I'd have a hard time living that kind of life. So as, yeah. as, as, well, as I'm I know, used to. I know you have a pilot's license, and you for years you've flown <clears throat> your own plane. Are you going to do that? Well, that's the only thing I had to give up, and I gave it up because the fact is that I know the FAA would frown on the fact that uh, if I had uh, surgery without going back through the medical deals with the uh, um, with the FAA, rather than than uh, just go out there because my medical's still good, but I'm not. I quit flying after I found out what, exactly what I had, and but now it's corrected, but yet and still I I call the doctor that I go to in Houston, and he told me that if I'd bring all the information back, I want to continue to fly, then he probably could get it okayed with the FAA. Up until that time, I'm just not flying. I'm flying Southwest. Okay. <laughs> Don't you have a history? Uh, let's go back to 1961. Heart surgery. Did, didn't you have open heart? That's right. And at that time, open heart was radical. I was a guinea pig. I mean, I had no money, and I went to uh, the Methodist Hospital in Houston, and that's when all of the foreigners was coming over having work done on their heart. And uh, a friend of mine worked in that particular um, unit, and I went to him, and he introduced me to these doctors, and I went up, and they did all these tests on me, and they said I had a 50-50 chance of uh, uh, having it done there. And finally, they called me, and they said, we've got an opening for you, and a Dr. Henley did the surgery, and uh, that's the way I was able to get my pilot's license. If I had, had that done... How many bypasses did you have? I didn't have a bypass. I had a, what they call a heart mummer. Okay. And it was uh, uh, where they had to make an incision in the heart muscle and stick his finger through that and open the valve up. So I had, I had to go through all of the heart problems again, too, and I had this, this surgery up here because they went, had to find out if my heart was strong enough to handle the anesthetics and anesthesia. And uh, I got to lay on the table and watch those valves. <laughs> 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 a little you, scary when you think you about were, it. You were a pretty young man at that time, weren't you? Absolutely. I was, uh, well, I was, what, about 26, I guess. Is your name Mickey Leroy Gilly? Well, <laughs> you know, I'm glad you mentioned that because um, my mother named me Mickey Leroy Gilly. But uh, on my birth certificate when I came out of the hospital, because of the fact I was uh, born in a charity hospital in Natchez, Mississippi, um, the birth certificate after I finally got a chance to do something overseas, I was going to do a tour, she wrote to Jackson, Mississippi, the capital, and asked for Mickey Leroy Gilly's birth certificate. They wrote her back and said, we have nobody born on March of 9th, 1936, except this little guy right here, and his name is George. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to go in front of a judge and have it changed, because everything that I had was in Mickey Leroy. But what was what was on the birth certificate? Just George, George, George Gilly. The uh, boy, boy, uh, being born on the March of 9th, 1936, the only birth certificate they had for a baby born that day was George Gilly. Uh, I read where your mother first thought you were a tumor. Absolutely. And then she thought you were a girl <laughs> and was going to name was going to call you Francis. That's right. She's going to call me. She's going to name me Francis. She's going to name me after her. So her name is Irene Francis, and she was going to name me Francis Irene. Who are these people on the screen right here? That's my mom and dad. I had to, that's my mom and dad. That's Arthur and Irene. And uh, my two famous cousins called uh, the lady on the left there, my mother, Aunt Rene. Well, I, I, you, how many siblings do you have? Uh, well, there's um, two boys and a girl, and my two brothers, they're already, already gone. The only one I got left is my sister. And I pulled a dirty crank on, prank on her when I found out I was going to have this surgery because my mother's gone and my two brothers are gone. And I called her up and I said, Sister, i got to have brain surgery. I said, they got to put a hole in my skull. I said, anything you'd like me to tell Mom and Dad? Oh. That was kind of cruel. Oh. You know? <laughs> she oh. screamed on the phone at me. <laughs> She's 11 years older than me. All right, let's talk about your famous cousin. I'm sure most every interview you do, uh, this happens. I talk about them all the time. I talk about them in my performance because I'm proud of both of them. This is, this is a, we got this off of your website. <laughs> this Seventh is, grade. Where was this taken? 
That was in Faraday, Louisiana. And that's uh, were Reverend you all, were, you, were you all in the seventh grade together? No. I was, uh, I think Jimmy was, uh, uh, I, I might have been under that. I'm not really sure. So uh, this picture was just, it's a, it's a composite. Yes, yeah, a composite. I think Jimmy was in the grade higher, and I think me and Jerry was closer to the seventh grade. Okay, who are we talking about? Talking about Reverend Jimmy Swigert, and of course the rock and roll legend Jerry Lee Lewis. And everybody knows the killer. <laughs> You grew up with them, didn't you? I grew up in Faraday, Louisiana with them. And they are uh, proud of both of them. I'm proud of Jerry Lee's in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Let me ask you this. If there had not been a Jerry Lee Lewis... There wouldn't have been a Mickey Gilly on the piano playing. I would not, not have gotten any music. I was very proud of Jerry Lee, and I felt like at the time when he went on the scene and started doing very well, my thought was, if he can do it, I can too. And I never dreamed it was going to take me as long. That's the reason why the Gillies turned out to be my home base there in, in Pasadena, Texas, because I didn't think I was going to make it in the music business. We opened Gillies up because I wanted to get on the side of making a decent living for my family. And Gillies was a, the catalyst, so to speak, for me to make more money. But you're talking about the, the club. The old nightclub Gillies, where we did the film The Urban Cowboy. Okay. I, uh, <clears throat> I think your, your career revolves around the hits the record hits, and the Urban Cowboy movie. No doubt about it. Uh, first of all, you did Room Full of Roses, and then you uh, went through a stream of hits. I Overlooked an Orchid. Uh, you did uh, the old George Jones song, Window Up Above. Yeah. Uh, Bill Anderson's City, City Lights. Lights. And later on, uh, Don't the Girls All Get Pretty in Absolutely. Closing Time. Anyway, I want to get back to Room Full of Roses for a moment. Wasn't that an accident? It was totally an accident. I went in to record She Called Me Baby All Night Long, the old Harlan Howard the song, She Called Me Baby All Night Long. Yeah. And the reason why I recorded that song is because the lady that had the jukebox in Gillies, the old nightclub Gillies in Pasadena, she had about 300 jukeboxes strung out because she had a vending company, and she wanted me to record that song, and I told her she could get Harlan Howard's version of it. And she said, you can't find that record anymore. She says, I'm in the rec uh, I buy records all the time for the jukebox. You cannot find that record, Gilly. I need you to record it for me. She said, I'll pay for the session if you'll go in and record She Called Me Baby for me. I said, next time in the recording studio, I'll do it for you. Well, this so happens, I went in the studio one day, and I said, let's cut this song for my friend. Minnie Ellerick was her name. She, dear friend, she's not with us anymore. But I recorded She Called Me Baby all night long, and I just happened to think, I said, let's do this old song, Room Full of Roses. Now, I grew up singing that song with Jimmy and Jerry. Jerry Lee had never recorded that song. And I said, let's put it down. So I actually cut it for the B-side. You know, like back then it was the 45s. Yeah. You know, the A-side and the B-side. And uh, when we released the record, I uh, listened to it, and I said, oh, my, they got the steel guitar so loud and so much echo on it. I said, this will never work. And I went back in to remix it, and somebody said, what do you care for? Nobody's going to ever hear it. 300 jukeboxes? I said, let it go. Took it to the radio stations. I said, why don't y'all play the Room Full of Roses? I just jacking with them a little bit, you know? And they said, sure, we'll play it. I said, when you advertise Gillies, I've been playing that song. And it just, bing, it took off like crazy. And I knew I had a hit because I started selling more records than I'd ever sold since I'd been in Houston. And then I came to Nashville, and I ended up talking to Eddie Kilroy, your friend, Eddie Kilroy. He's, he was responsible right. for me getting you on that morning show when you was out at WSM out there. Hold it down. Let's hold it just a second. <laughs> Man, you are on a roll here. <laughs> You're one fast-talking dude tonight. <laughs> anyway, Too much energy. I want to. I, I want to go to your live album and uh, let's pick up a little bit of room full of roses one more time. Okay. <laughs> if I sent a rose to you, every time you made me, yeah. nice memory. I had been a George Morgan hit. Absolutely. About 1948 or 49. Absolutely. 
Yeah, and I found that in your uh, recently released Mickey Gilly, uh, recorded live at the Mickey Gilly Theater. You did, you did this August the 8th. Yes. Remarkably. We a less, le uh, less time. Boy, how shall I say this? You were less than a month out of the hospital. July the 8th is when I had the uh, surgery, and I don't know what the you date did this is on August the, back. the 8th. August the 8th. That's well, pretty, re pretty remarkable. Well, I'm feeling great. <laughs> you can tell my mouth works overtime, <laughs> can't you? <laughs> we're talking to Mickey Gilly. We'll continue right after this. Hi folks, I'm Patrick Gotch with a few words about RFD HD, our new 24-hour high-definition television channel that is now available to provide you, our audience, with a second channel of rural programming to further expand your viewing options for ag, equine, rural lifestyle, video options, traditional music, and entertainment shows. At this time, if you are not watching RFD HD already, we ask that you contact your cable or satellite provider now and request that they add RFD HD to their lineup without delay. Even if you do not have an HD television set yet, chances are you will soon. And now is when these cable and satellite companies are deciding which HD channels to offer on their particular system. Requests from you, their customers, will truly help our efforts to gain carriage on your system and reserve a slot for rural programming. As always, I appreciate your support of RFD TV and now RFD HD. It makes a huge difference. Each week, you can have an insider's guided tour of the exciting world of women's pro rodeo. Experience the competition. Meet the stars. Get tips from the pros and so much more. Watch Women's Pro Rodeo Today, the official video magazine of the WPRA, where the elite compete every Wednesday night right here on RFD TV. Thank you for watching The Machinery Show and making it such a huge success. We've already started shooting season two, which will be jam-packed with a machinery shed full of hot iron and cool tools. We're crisscrossing the country shooting Top Shop tours, machine repeat auction reports, all around the farm ideas, and more. Season two of the Successful Farming Machinery Show premieres here on RFD TV on September 4th at 8, 7 central. I don't think I said it, but you can find this album at uh, MickeyGilly.com. Mickey, uh, this is a town of music. A lot of people ask me how Jerry Lee Lewis is. How is his health? Well, the last time I had the pleasure of visiting with Jerry Lee, I was in Memphis, and uh, we were up there to see Billy Bob Thornton, the actor, and uh, ran into him, and uh, he seemed to be doing fine. He's just... Uh, I don't know how many days he's working on the road. I mean, I know I work a lot more than he does, but I don't know whether his health is to the point that he can handle more dates or if he just don't want to work that much. He probably doesn't have to. He's about a year older than you, isn't he? He's six months older than I am. Okay. Uh, you have a, a, a wonderful honor out in Hollywood. You're in the walkway of fame, the Hollywood walkway of stars, whatever they call it. Absolutely. Next to Bill Cosby, aren't you? You know, it's right across from the Chinese Theater. I don't know exactly who all's around me, but uh, uh, I do have the Hollywood Walk of Fame star out there. How did and, that happen? Well, I was doing, you introduced me to people. And in fact, you worked with me for a while for the Arthritis Foundation. Yes. You remember all of that. Yeah. And through the uh, success of that telethon that we were doing, and through the fact that uh, Sandy Brokaw and David Brokaw, the Brokaw Company, they went to the people and they said, look, we got this gentleman that's had this many records and he's had all this success with doing all these different TV shows and everything else. <laughs> and we feel like he could use a, a star in Hollywood Walk of Fame. And they gave it to me. Because but of... The Arthritis of, Foundation. Because of your public service. Right. And they, they gave it to me. And I'm very, very proud of it, too. It's very well, good. I read it was next to Bill Cosby. Well, it, it might be. I hadn't been out there to take a look at it. <laughs> What about making records with Jerry Lee? Wasn't there an idea on the table, me and Jerry Lee? 
There was some ideas about me and going out in the uh, the recording studio with Jerry Lee and recording with him, and a couple of times we made plans to do that. It never did materialize. And then when he did The Last Man Standing, I wondered why they didn't ask me to, you know, do a song with him or something, but they didn't. So I don't know if there'll ever be a record of me and Jerry Lee together. But. Well, how about uh, Don't Be Ashamed of Your Age? Well, we did that on your show, uh, Pop Goes the Country, yeah. I think. Did you ever we, record that? No, just on your show. The only time. We used to do it when we were kids when we was growing up, and uh, he had, a, he had a, a little radio show in Natchez, Mississippi. Uh, and I forgot what the call letters are on the station, but he, he did a, a show in Natchez, Mississippi, and I, I'd go over with him, and I sang with him on his show in Natchez. And that's how we come up with that song. Because it, it's just an old song by somebody else, I think. Uh, I think Red Foley and Ernest Tubb. I think you're right. And, and we learned the song, and... That's, that's how we came about it. But it, it's a fun song. Don't be ashamed of your age. You told me a story one time about the killer uh, pouring uh, lighter fluid on a piano and setting on Well, fire. that was the story that came, came about. They said that, uh, that him and Chuck Berry got in an argument up, up in the northeastern part of the United States, and uh, they were arguing about who was going to close the show. And finally, Jerry Lee said, uh, I'm going to close the show. He said, I'll go on first, but I'm going to close it. And they said that he got him a can of lighter fluid, and he went out there and he did all of his songs and took that lighter fluid and squirted it all over the piano and threw his lighter on it, and boom, it went up. <laughs> he walked up and said, follow that. <laughs> <laughs> now, the, I don't know if that's totally true or not, but that's what the rumor was anyway. <clears throat> Let's talk about Gillies. Okay. World's largest nightclub at one time, and there you shot the urban cowboy with John Travolta. Tell me that story. That was a very thrilling time in my career, I don't mind telling you, because I never thought that they were going to do it. I went out to Hollywood, and we signed the contract for Paramount Pictures to come in and shoot the film. And the gentleman by the name of Aaron Latham came down and wrote this article because of the mechanical bull that my business partner, Sherwood Cryer, installed in Gillies. I came in. I was very upset about it. I said, yeah, it's not going to work. I said, people are going to get hurt on that thing because it's a rodeo training device. It wasn't ever meant to be an, an entertainment establishment. He said, no, no, no. He says, all these people going to come in. They want to ride that thing, you know? Well, we did, had some lawsuits on it, but it turned out to be a blessing in disguise because this guy from New York came down, Aaron Latham, and he wrote this, wrote this article in Esquire magazine. And I was really upset about the magazine article because every other thing was boy meets girl, twang, twang. Boy falls in love with girl, twang, twang. I thought he was making fun of country music. And I was going out to the uh, coast to do, uh, I think it was either Mike Douglas or Merv Griffin or Dinah Shore, somebody out there, was going to do a talk thing. And uh, Cryer went out with me, Mr. Cryer went out with me, and he said, don't say anything bad about that article because we might get a movie out of it. And I said, what side of the bed did you fall off on? I said, who's going to do a movie on this particular article in the Esquire magazine? Well, it turned out that he said, they're talking to John Travolta. And I went, uh-oh, John Travolta, Saturday Night Fever, Country Night Fever. And then it made sense. So that's how it came about, and uh, it, it, was, it was a great thing. I didn't believe they was going to do it until I saw the Paramount trucks coming into the parking lot. Well, you were all over that picture. I had a good time with uh, John Travolta. I got, even got to fly with him at that time. You know, he's flying the big airplanes now, but I flew with him in a 414 Cessna out of Hobby Airport. Thrill of my life because I was sitting there with him. He was, had an instructor, and he was flying. And uh, so I can say that I flew with him. Can you tell me a, a John Travolta story that, uh, that happened on the movie set? Well, I can just tell you that some of the articles that came out about him being uh, not uh, cordial with uh, uh, the people there, I thought it was totally uh, unfounded because he was so nice to all the kids there. In fact, my mother-in-law made a big meal and brought it over to the recording studio right beside the club, and he came over and ate with us. So, I mean, some of the things they wrote about him I thought was just unfounded totally because he was such a nice guy. It's unbelievable. He treated everybody the same. You know, that movie actually changed the culture in this country for a while. Absolutely. It made uh, country music and wearing cowboy hats and boots and all of that. And, uh, and radio stations changed their formats. <laughs> and it, it was amazing. Well, it was a country night fever, and, and John Travolta brought it all together. I had a guy on the elevator over at the Roadway Inn here in Nashville. I was going to with him, and he says, I want to thank you for what you've done for country music. I said, don't thank me. Thank John Travolta. He's the one that pulled it off. I didn't do it. <laughs> well, you had a hit song that uh, came out of that picture, and we want to play it for okay. you. Okay. This is uh, back to your live album again. This is Stand By Me, and it was a remake of an earlier hit for Benny King. Absolutely. 
is good in the land is God and the moon be the only light we'll see no I won't be afraid I won't be afraid just as long just as long Darling, stand by me Won't you stand by me If you're in need Won't you stand by me And uh, Johnny Lee, of course, had Looking for Love from the same picture. Absolutely. Probably the major song in the film was Looking for Love. How did you find Johnny Lee? Johnny came to me uh, when I was working at a club down there before I ever had any hits, before the Gillies ever existed, and he came to me and put a story on me about how he had uh, saw me down in Galveston doing a show with Larry Kane, which was a, a show that we all did, like something like Dick Clark, you know. We had to do it. And uh, uh, he put the story on me. He just got out of the Navy, and, but he said, I sit in, I did this, and so I said, oh, yeah, great, great. And, you know, he said, you remember me? I said, oh, yeah, come on, you want to sing a song? And he came up on the stage, and he, could, he was singing things like Blueberry Hill and things like that, and he had that type of voice. And I asked him, you know, I said, would, would you like to uh, maybe work out here with me? And I went to the club owners, and I asked him, I said, you know, would you be willing to hire Johnny? And he tells the story about I got him $90 a week. <laughs> but back then, that was a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me show you a picture. I, I found this in my, among my souvenirs. Uh, premier issue, volume one, number one. Uh, it was a magazine <laughs> published by Gillies. <laughs> what happened to Gillies? It's no longer well, there. Is Gillies it? burnt in, uh, I think it was 89 or 9, I think it was 89, I believe it, it burnt. Uh, I got it closed down because me and my business partner got on the outs and uh, I filed a lawsuit. I won the lawsuit and I ended up with, uh, with the property, but uh, I didn't want it. I didn't, I didn't want the property. I, all I wanted was the name off of it. I wanted my name off of it. And uh, so they awarded me the Gilly logo, and that's mine, and that's what I use. Well, uh, it certainly has been good to you. It's been very good to me, and uh, I thank John Travolta every night when I go to bed. So thanks <laughs> for keeping my career alive. <laughs> We're going to go to the uh, telephone, and uh, our number here is 1-866-547-9696. You can call and talk to Mickey Gilly right after this. Family Reunion is coming to RFD-TV. Each week, the legends sing the songs that made them famous. Plus some moments you might not expect. I'm the walking bottle of Pepto-Bismol. You'll laugh. You'll sing along and be royally entertained by these country legends every week on Country's Family Reunion. Premiering Thursday, September 4th at 6 p.m. on RFD-TV. Championship bull riders don't mind bending a few rules, like objects in mirror might be closer than they appear. Or never grab a tiger by the tail. And don't forget, what goes up must come down. And here's one for you. When we're on RFD TV, don't sit too close to the set. It's not good for your ride. Championship bull riding. Watch us break the rules. Every Wednesday night starting at 10 Eastern on RFD TV. The Roping Show with Tyler Magnus, an informative, entertaining, and educational look inside the world of team roping, airs three times weekly here on RFD-TV. Tyler Magnus has won more than his share of awards in the arena. His horsemanship skills are second to none, and he shares his knowledge with you during every episode of The Roping Show. Join us twice on Thursdays and Sunday afternoon. If you'd like more information, visit us online at theropingshow.com. What goes together like a horse and buggy, a tractor and a plow, a boy and his dog? 
It's Music and Motors. Get ready for the finest in musical entertainment and racing on anything on wheels. I turned radio on. It was country music I listened to. Ladies and gentlemen, get in tune and start your engines with Music and Motors coming soon to Sunday night on RFD TV, rural America's most important network. RFD TV is now proudly distributed and available through these satellite and cable companies. Tell your friends and neighbors about RFD TV and thanks for watching. Hello everybody, this is David Frizzell inviting you to join me September 1st, 2008 at 7 p.m. Central Time for Frizzell and Friends in Concert. September 1st, 2008 at 7 p.m. Central Time. I'll see you then. It is phone time. My name is Ralph Emery in the yellow jacket, and Mickey Gilly is here in the yellow jacket. <laughs> and we're going to go to, to Bob in Missouri. Hello, Bob. Hey, Bob. What happened to Bob in Missouri? Can anybody tell me where Bob is? Not yet. Not yet. Okay, I'm going to go to the uh, email then. Uh, Richard Massey of Lexington, North Carolina, wondered if you and Jimmy Swaggart and Jerry Lee Lewis ever recorded anything together? We haven't recorded anything, and I doubt seriously that there will ever be a recording made by the three of us. Did you, ever sing, did you ever sing together for the fun of it? Uh, when we were kids, we did, but uh, probably there would never be a song recorded by the three of us unless it was a religious tune, because I don't think Reverend Swaggart would do it. Okay. Did we ever find Bob? Hey, Bob? Hey, Bob? You're embarrassing me, Bob. <laughs> Somebody. Uh, okay. Email number two. Actually, we had three emails with the same question. Are you any relation to Penny Gilly, who has a show on RFD TV? As far as I know, Blood King, Blood Ken, no. But uh, I think she married somebody, uh, and what she told me was she married a gentleman by the name of Gilly, and she kept the Gilly name for her last name. But uh, she's a one. I, I'd like to, uh, you know, claim her because she's a beautiful girl. Okay, uh, let's try Peggy from Arkansas on the phone. Hello, Peggy. Hello. What's your question? Uh, I'd like to know where Mickey Gilly uh, came up with the. Uh, MGM, the MG necklace. Oh, the, 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 the necklace he's wearing tonight. Yes, uh -huh. <laughs> well, it's a long story. When uh, I was with uh, Playboy Records, I had several number one songs, and they gave me a, a, a sort of a piano cutout with a block letters MG, and I had it taken apart, and I had it rebuilt to uh, be the initials like I like to wear them, and I, basically the way I signed my name with the M and the G. So that's how I came up with it, and I've had it for, uh, oh, I guess ever since about 75, 1975. Long time. Long time. So it was a gift. It was a gift from Playboy Records. Okay. And Eddie Kilroy, I might say. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to go to David Harding up in Indiana. Uh, who, who paired you with Charlie McLean? Well, that story came about because I was out in Hollywood and we were doing a little small bit on Chips, the movie, uh, the TV shows, Chips. And I was listening to her sing and I started singing along with her and I said, we could do some duets. And I had noticed how Conway and Loretta were doing their things together. And I thought maybe if I could get Charlie McLean to record with me, that we could do some shows together and it'd be like Charlie and Mickey Gilly and then we'd close the show together, like having three acts on instead of just two. And uh, I went and I approached her and I said, uh, would you like to do some duets? And I had some songs. They didn't use any of the songs I had, but I was in Nashville recording and found out that Nora Wilson was recording Charlie McLean right down the road. And they come down and said, Charlie's recording. Won't you come on down? I went down. He had that song, Paradise Tonight. 
and we recorded it right there on the spot. And it was number one. It was the number one song. I it count that as number one, even though was, uh, I had 17, but one of them was with Charlie McClain. <laughs> uh, you also did an old uh, Roy Orbison song with her, didn't you? Candyman? I did Candyman with her. It didn't make number one, but I thought we had a pretty good version of it. It was a fun thing. Let's go to Trisha in West Virginia. Hello, Trisha. Hi, how are you? Good. What's on your mind? Well, uh, I'll just give you a quick comment. I'm glad you're back on RFD, just echoing what everybody else has been saying. Thank you. And uh, I just wanted to let Mickey know I'm, I'm glad he's still out there performing. I've, I saw him years ago with Gary Morris up at Valley Forge Music Fair. Wow. And I've seen him out in Branson a few times and at the restaurant he's got out there. Um, and I just had a question. I wonder, Mickey... Since they did a, a movie several years ago about Jerry Lee with Dennis Quaid. Great Ball of we Fire. Yeah, and you were talking about Urban Cowboy, which I, I loved. Um, if somebody was to approach you about making a movie about your life, who do you think you would like to have play you, if anybody? <laughs> you know, can, can you come up with somebody? <laughs> Well, of course, I mean, I'd want somebody, you know, like Matt Damon, but uh, I don't know <laughs> if I could get him or not, you know. Uh, but uh, I keep saying, you know, that one day they're going to do a film on Mickey Gilly, Jerry Lewis, and Reverend Swaggart. Now, whether that'll ever happen, I don't know, but uh, uh, it would be interesting if they did all three of us. Well, Tricia, I thank you for your question. It's a good one. Well, thank you. We have a regular viewer, Wayne Wright, who has sent us many emails, and uh, Wayne lives over in North Carolina. He wants to know who pitched Fool for Your Love to you. Why did you record that song? I recorded Fool for Your Love because Jim Ed Norman, the producer that was producing Mickey Gilly at the time, he was a great song uh, guy. I mean, he came up with all kinds of songs. He was responsible for giving me nine number one country singles in a row, just about. And I mean, you know, I had uh, Fool for Your Love, Put Your Dreams Away, That's All That Matters to Me, You Don't Know Me. Um, I can't remember, uh, Stand By Me. He picked all those songs. I would have, half of them I'd have never picked if I'd have heard them, you know. But he picked them and he said, well, do, you'll do a good job on these tunes. Well, wait and, a minute. Stand By Me was in the movie. It was in the movie, but he picked it. I, I didn't pick it to sing. Jim Ed Norman produced it on me. And that song, I, I told you earlier before we, when you was off air, I walked out of the recording studio on him. I had to go back and apologize to Jim Ed for I'll walking out. I'll get back to that story. Let's go to <laughs> Texas while we got him on the phone. Slater from Texas. Yes, I'd like to know if he remembers doing a, uh, doing a t TV program with uh, Lee Majors and, uh, and, and, uh, and Jerry Lee Lewis on TV down here. Uh, well, I... I know Lee Majors, and I did the, the Fall Guy twice yeah, with Lee Majors. That's what I was talking about, the Fall Guy. <laughs> I don't remember Jerry Lee re doing the Fall Guy, but uh, I, I did it twice. And they had one segment on it had some Elvis impersonators on yeah, there. Yeah, I remember y'all had some on there. Yeah, but... Uh, because I watched it. <laughs> I don't remember Jerry Lee ever doing anything on the Fall Guy, but I did it twice with Lee Majors. Because he, he, he did do the Fall Guy. Absolutely. Oh, yes. oh, oh Jerry Lee did? I think he did once. Uh, not sure about that. I, maybe he did, but I'm not really sure. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Stand By Me is a favorite of Judy Pittman at Halifax, North Carolina. She and her husband, apparently, uh, she says, that's our song. <laughs> and she, she just wrote me an email to... Uh, pass that along to you uh, that you have brought so much to their life. Well, I appreciate that because I have a little lady in Tulsa, Oklahoma by the name of Nancy Harrington. Uh, Harrison, I'm sorry. Nancy Harrison. And it's her favorite song. When she's at my theater, I, the first thing I got to do is say, here's your song, Nancy. And I sing it for her. <laughs> well, this is Judy Pittman of Halifax, well, Judy, North Carolina. Judy, you come to Gilly's Theater and I'll have, say, hey, here's a song, Judy. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go to the state of Georgia. Virgil. Hello, Virgil. Hello, Ralph. How you doing? Good. What's on your mind? I got two questions, one for you and one for Mickey. Okay. All right. Mickey, did you get your uh, start in church? Uh, yes. Well, I mean, I started playing piano and singing with my mother in church, yes. And, of course, I picked up most of the piano playing, you know, from uh, my cousin, Jerry Lee Lewis. He started playing when he was very, very young, and I didn't start until I was about 13. Uh-huh. And uh, the question that I got for, uh, for you is, uh, who was it wrote that song? It said, uh, you can't turn that on, Marie. That, uh, that says, uh, mm. Mm. Virgil, we're waiting on you. <laughs> yeah, it says, uh, alcohol don't help at all, but most folks think it does. It numbs the brain, leads to pain, to a heartache lingering still. Who did that? 
Who do, who recorded that song? Right. I don't know. I don't have any idea either. I, I can I remember it being around years ago, and I did play a lot of records years ago, but I'm afraid I can't help you, Virgil. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let's take another phone call. I'm out of emails here. Let's go to Belinda down in Louisiana. My home state. That is that is your home state. Right. Yep. Hey. Uh, well, wait a minute. You were born in Natchez, weren't born you? Born in Natchez, but I was raised in Faraday, Louisiana. Okay, Belinda. Got a street in Faraday, Louisiana, by the way. Named after you? Yeah, Mickey Gilly. Okay, uh, Belinda, what's on your mind? Oh, I just want to say we enjoy your show, Ralph. And Mickey, I just want to uh, enjoy your sh show in Branson. But do you have, do you going to have any cr uh, Christmas show in, uh, this year at the WT Theater? You, you know, I've been, I've been, we've been thinking about putting a Christmas performance together. If we do, it'll probably be 50-50. I'll probably try to sing some of the songs that have been hits for me and then go into some of the Christmas songs. I hate to try to do a complete Christmas performance because I don't have the staging in to, to make it really, really Christmas a feel for it. So uh, you, you don't feel like you have enough Christmas decorations? Well, I, I, we have Christmas decorations, but in order... I saw Tony Orlando do a Christmas show there in Branson. After I saw his show... I came back and I said, no more Christmas with Mickey Gilly because it was undoubtedly the greatest Christmas show I'd ever seen. It turned into almost, it, it was an event, so to speak, and I, I, I like things like that. But when he got through with his Christmas performance, I, I was just blown away. And I can't, I used to tell the people in my performance, I said, look, folks, we're going to do some Christmas songs for you, but if you want to see a real Christmas show, <laughs> go see Tony Orlando down at the Yellow, uh, Yellow Ribbon Theater because he's so good. <laughs> All right, let me mention that next week... Uh, we are going to rerun the Statler Brothers' visit to our show. It'll be Labor Day. And then uh, on the 8th of September, we'll be back live with the possum, George Jones and Georgette, his daughter, the daughter he had with Tammy Wynette. And the old possum's coming out that night with Georgette. And if you have a question for George or Georgette, send it to Ralph at rfdtv.com. Be back with Mickey Gilly right after this. Saturday night has always been special night on RFD TV and Saturday nights just got better due to popular demand we have now expanded Saturday nights into a real music row of entertainment with all of your favorite one-hour music and entertainment shows placed back-to-back -back for six hours of non-stop enjoyment call up your friends and neighbors and invite them over for an unforgettable evening that starts off with the Gaither Gospel Hour now at 6 p.m. Eastern Time Followed by the new Crook and Chase show with Lori Ann and Charlie at 7 p.m. The Jim Owens Classic Country Hour at 8 p.m. Off to Minnesota for Midwest Country at 9 p.m. And an encore hour of Big Joe and the Big Joe Polka Show at 10 p.m. And finally wrapping up the evening with Ralph Emery and his special guest at 11. Where else can you get gospel, country, traditional country, polka, laughs, and legendary interviews all in one night? Of course, it's only on RFD-TV. Join us this Saturday night. Next time you're out in the country and you look across a field and you see a stretch of trees and bushes and natural grasses protecting a stream or a wetland, it's all right to say a little thank you to a farmer or rancher who obviously cares about clean water, soil conservation, and healthy fish and wildlife populations. A message from the U.S. Department of Agriculture's Natural Resources Conservation Service and the National Conservation Buffer Initiative. If you like preaching and singing, or roping or riding, then you will love Cowboy Church. I'm Susie Luxinger. And I'm Russ Weaver. We get to hold church at many of the biggest western and rodeo and cowboy events around the country, and we'd like for you to be a part of that. We sure would. We get to go to Cheyenne, Wyoming, Las Vegas for the National Finals Rodeo, and at the Barry Burke Championship Junior Calf Rope, and we go all over the country. We want you to join us. For Cowboy Church on RFD TV. We'll see you there.
Well, you know, speaking of Christmas music, as we were earlier, I think you you cut that as a Christmas song as well. Yeah, I, I cut it to be a joke, and they put it on the uh, album, and I, I wasn't too happy with it because, I don't know, I don't think that song should have been a Christmas, a Christmas so, song. Girls, girls all, all get, get prettier around Christmas time. <laughs> <laughs> you had a producer by the name of Jim Ed Norman. You brought him up earlier, and... Uh, he changed your style and did a lot for you, and yet you, when you did uh, Stand By Me with him, was that the first record? First record was uh, Stand By Me. He and produced you walked it on out me. on him, didn't you? I walked out on him because I didn't think that uh, he knew what he was doing. I had to go back later and apologize to him. I wait, found wait, wait, wait. How many, cut, how many times have you recorded this song when you decided to walk out on him? Well, I didn't know at the time that he was tracking my voice. And he was just sitting back and he was listening with his eyes shut. And he'd say, can you do it one more time? Can you do it one more time? I'd make a mistake and he'd just let the tape roll. And I'd pick it up and start singing. And all of a sudden I said, this guy, I don't know what the heck he's doing, you know. And I must have cut it uh, seven or eight times. And finally, on about the eighth time, and him sitting back and listening like this, you know, in his chair, I finished it about that eighth or ninth cut, wherever it was, you know. And I said, hey, I'll see y'all. Good night. <laughs> Out I went. And I called, uh, I called my business partner, Mr. Cryer, and I said, this guy, I don't know what he's doing. I said, this is ridiculous. I'm not going to record like this. Well, the record came out. It was a number one song for me, and I had to go back and apologize. <laughs> was, that, was that the biggest song of your career? Well, it was big because it was in the uh, film and the soundtrack for The Urban Cowboy. You know, the, the, I think the, the music uh, in The Urban Cowboy probably went platinum, but, you know, I never had one go platinum, but uh, that, that song was in the soundtrack, so I was very happy with the fact that I was there. I'm going to go back in your life for a moment. I never really found out uh, how you got into Gillies in the first place. Now, you, you know, you told me you were a poor boy. Absolutely. And uh, here you're, uh, suddenly you're a business partner with uh, Mr. Cryer. Absolutely. In a nightclub. How did you, how did you reach that point? I had gone across town. I was performing at, a, at an old club called the Bel Air Ballroom, and I was doing quite well. And uh, uh, Mr. Carrara came over to see me, and he says, look, I got a club across town. You need to come take a look at it. And I went over. To make a long story short, we walked in. It was the old nightclub, which became Gillies. At that time, it was called Shelley's. And he told me that he says, I'll change everything. Just tell me what it needs if you'll come over here and play the music here, because you need to be on this side of town, because I'd worked at the Nessadale for about 10 years down the road, and we'd always done very well. And Sherwood had always booked people like George Jones and uh, all these country acts to come in and play Shelley's. And he wanted me over there. So uh, he made me a deal I couldn't refuse. In other words, he said, I'll make you part owner of the club. I'll give you 50% of what the club does, and I'll give you this much money for you, you and your band. And uh, I said, gee, this is great. So I ended up over there with him, and uh, he, uh, he said, what do you want to call it? And I said, call it Send In if you want to. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> he said, let's call it Gillies. And I said, yeah, my name in lights out there, you know. So he called it Gillies, and that's how he got started. <clears throat> 1971. Wow. So you were off and running. I was, was off and running. And we did very well the first week we was open. Let me ask you about some other people in your life. Conway Twitty. One of my dearest friends. I still miss him today. He's one of the greatest guys. He helped me more in my musical career than anybody ever helped me at all. I sat and talked to him one night. I didn't think he liked me at first, but Big Joe that got killed, uh, he's told me, he says, Conway likes you. He likes that nervous piano. He called it nervous piano. You know. Didn't he call you Gilligan? Yeah, Gilligan. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, he said, just go up and sit down and talk to him. So uh, one night he was playing his guitar on, on the bus, and I, went, I was from traveling with him at the time, and I went up and I said, Conway, can I talk to you just for a minute? He said, his guitar down. I must talk to him for about two hours. And I was telling him that I wanted to put a group together because I wanted to play some clubs. I was energetic and I wanted to do more than just do those concert tours. And um, so he began to tell me about the road and about everything he, I needed to do, and it helped me tremendously. He was a wonderful guy. I loved him. 
I want to ask you if you remember a night we were together on the road <laughs> with uh, Conway Twitty, Crystal Gale, and we were in Indianapolis. And you asked me to play my old flames out burning another honky tonk down. I bet that's what you're going to say, right? Well, that's not the entire story. <laughs> Do you remember what happened to you? Well, I remember doing the song, but I don't remember the, the ending. Well, the crew got together and they found this steel box and they loaded it with gunpowder. <laughs> <laughs> and they put it inside your piano, and it went off right in the middle of your number. Do you remember that? I remember doing the song, and I remember that it would scare the devil out of me. I know that. And you set that up, I think, didn't you? No, I didn't do that. <laughs> but I, I, no, actually, it was a conspiracy. Yeah. There were several of us in on that. But the song was "My Old Flames Out Burning Another Honky Tonk." Yeah, Man. I thought I that was very appropriate. Yeah, it was. Wasn't it? Uh, but uh, that's when uh, uh, Crystal also came out uh, and sang uh, Conway's daughter's part. Oh, okay. Con yeah. uh, Joni. Joni. Yeah. He used to do Don't Cry Joni. Yeah. And uh, he, didn't, uh, he didn't know Crystal had uh, a microphone. And when he used to do both parts, his part yeah. and Joni's part, and Crystal came out singing Joni's part and kind of surprised him. <laughs> but that was a good tour. Oh, I tell you what, uh, Conway was a, such a great guy. I, 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 can I tell a quick story about Conway? Sure. It was me and Conway, Loretta, and Cal Smith, and Conway goes out, and, and I'm, I've got to open up the next part of the performance, and Conway goes out and gets about three or four standing ovations and encore like crazy. And when he got finally got off the stage, he walked by me and he says, I wouldn't give that spot to a dry cleaner. <laughs> <laughs> I'll never forget it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, Porter Wagner ever introduce you as Mickey Gillis? Uh, you know, I don't know, but I, I tell you what, uh, you know, his, his was the first show I ever performed in Nashville, Tennessee, and Dolly Parton was there. I had nothing for Dolly. I don't know if I'd have got through the song, because I was scared to death. You were on the Porter Wagner show? Porter Wagner show? show back when I wrote Room Full of Roses hit. Why, what, what scared you? What, I never had done a, a major show like that. And to me, being in Nashville, working with a a legend in country music already, and here I am, an old country boy from Fairdale, Louisiana, never had a hit. I mean, I was scared, you know? And I went out there, and, and Dolly said, just relax, just relax. <laughs> Tell me about your family. How many, uh, how long have you been married to Vivian? Uh, I've been married 40 plus years. Got married in 1962. How many children do you have? I got one by her, and I got three by my first wife. You have twins? Have twins. I have a uh, boy and a girl, Keith and Kathy, and my oldest son, Michael, uh, he does quite well for himself. He has a manufacturing uh, company that he manufactures boats called Gulf Coast Boats, and does excellent. He's a, and all, all three of the kids are wonderful, and uh, my son, Keith, fixing to open up a nightclub. He's going to call it uh, Keith Gillies Dance Hall. I told him, I said, you can't use Gillies on it because I got it leased out to the people in Texas. <laughs> guy in Dallas has the logo Gillies on it, so I can't use Gillies on a nightclub anywhere in Texas. You mean there is a Gillies in Texas? There, there's one in uh, Dallas, uh, Texas, called Gillies, and uh, he Which, has the right to use that logo on the nightclub. Do you ever go there and sing? I've done it a couple of times. Uh, he told me that he's changed managers now, our, our management there in the club. I told him, so if you need me, call me. So... Maybe that I can go back and perform for him again. I don't know yet. You still have your theater in uh, Branson? I still have the theater, and I work my theater about 180 days a year. And uh, it's been uh, God sent to me because I got everything there that uh, I tell the people a lot of times, you know, when I first got off of the road and I got to theater, I had to hire somebody to shake my bed so I could sleep. <laughs> 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 oh, this has been fun. I hate to quit this. Do you have, speaking of sleeping, uh, I read in one of your bios that you have to have the TV on to go to oh, sleep. Oh, I, I, I got to have some noise going on. I turn the TV on when the commercial comes on, I'm asleep. <laughs> <laughs> and I wake up because I'm mad because I want to know what, what happened, what happened? Then I have to ho wait for a rerun. Next week, uh, the Statler brothers will be here, my friends. And then in two weeks, George Jones and his daughter, Georgette Jones. Tonight, we've had the great pleasure of sharing an hour with Mickey Gilly and his yellow coat. <laughs> <laughs> Mickey, thank you so much. Ralph, it's been a pleasure. Thanks for having me on your show. Come back and see me sometime. I'll do it. And my friends, thank you for watching. Good night, everybody. <laughs>